if you got an idea and it can make a difference in the world, it's your duty to do it. Mm. Whether it's a book or not, I don't even care. But, you know, we are here for a reason, and it's not just to take up space and breathe oxygen. Hi, I'm Ebony, and I believe that stories change lives, and everyone has a story worth telling. Sometimes, unfortunately, we let our self-doubt get in the way of us writing our stories and sharing our stories. So that's why I created Motivation to Write as a source of motivation and inspiration to help writers like you and me share our stories with the world. So I talk to the experts ranging from entrepreneurs to marketers to, to authors to uh, therapists, to psychologists who share their knowledge and their advice to help writers like you and me step into our full potential. Doug Crow is an investor, brand specialist, and writer who helps entrepreneurs optimize their businesses and create lasting relationships with their clients. He has contributed to the Chicago Tribune, MSN Money, and the Seattle Times as a best-selling author. On Chicago's WLS AM 890 ABC Radio, he created the first real estate program, The Real Estate Coach. Doug Crow believes in harnessing the power of multimedia, a strong team, and a big goal to propel you to success. Doug Crow, I am so happy to have Doug Crow here because you, um, you're very interesting to say the least. <laughs> okay, business strategist, investor, author. Um, so, and I know you want to talk a lot about perseverance because it seems like that's been very important in your life. So why don't we first talk about of those things that I've listed, business strategist, mm-hmm. author, investor, which did you kind of step into first? Ah, uh, stepped into first. Um, strangely enough, <clears throat> I stepped into being an, an investor first. Okay. I'm uh, right out of college. I bought a piece of real estate and started investing in real estate, um, in my early twenties. Mm-hmm. And uh, then got into um, you know a bunch of other things as I went down the path of you know careers and working for companies, started my own businesses. It just blossomed from there. Okay, yeah. so then th- you started in, I guess, starting businesses and investing in businesses is what you said. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. how then did you uh, take that? And become what is a business called a business strategist. Is that yeah. something you learned kind of like on the job or? It's, it kind of came in um, from a couple different areas, Ebony. It was like I started out, you know, as a real estate investor, had a school, I t- trained people how to invest in real estate. And then after 2008, you know, everything sort of went away. And, you know, a lot of people had foreclosures and bankruptcies. And I had, you know, 19 foreclosures and a, and wow. a bank. Yeah, it was a real, real big, pretty big dip for me personally and professionally, spiritually, everything went down the, down the tubes. Mm-hmm. But, um, during that time, during my boohoo phase, I decided to write a book and, uh, mm-hmm. the book, the book is awful. Um, so I learned how to, I learned how to do a better job with those by hiring better writers and editors and proofers and designers and started to get into publishing business. And as I talk to people, some of them can really benefit from being an author. But not everybody. So right. I started advising them on the, you know, my decades of of knowledge and wisdom and in marketing and sales psychology. Well, you might not need a book, but you definitely need to repurpose your brand or, you know, build some other things here. So I was just sort of naturally fell into the business strategy thing as an offshoot of publishing. And th- did the author part of that? Because I mean, you said your first book wasn't a success. Oh, um, how how did you learn to kind of hone that craft? Mm. That's a great question. I um, you know, a lot of people write for a cathartic reason. You know, we need to yeah. write, write the book that we both need to read. Mm-hmm. That's what I was doing. And then when I was all finished with it, set aside, went back and looked at it, I realized how bad it was. I'm like, gosh, you know, I'm a decent writer. I write decent copy, whatnot, but this book is just, uh, it didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. But I had a radio show on for a number of years in Chicago, on ABC Radio, and I had some people on there who you may know. Laurel Langmire, Robert Kiyosaki, these people had been on my show. So I was able to contact them and said, you know, I'm curious about this book thing, you know, and they're both New York Times bestsellers. So how do you, how'd you able to do that? And Laurel was the best. She said, I don't write. I'm like, what do you mean? Because you're New York Times, like three time bestselling author. Yeah, but I don't write them. <laughs> I have ghostwriter. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Uh-huh. And the more I started going into the, in the ghostwriting industry, realizing there's a big gap there as well. And there's people that hire ghostwriters, but the ghostwriter doesn't know them, doesn't understand their pacing, their voice, their style or anything. So over the years, we've honed this 
this system of journalist, ghostwriter, editor that work in conjunction with the author to make sure the book just sounds exactly like them. And it doesn't happen right away. It takes us months to do it. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, people are like, oh my gosh, this sounds better than me. <laughs> so, right, 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 so I learned my craft through trial and error and through going to the people that do it for, um, you know, for a living. So you are a ghostwriter as well. I was. Now my company has a dozen other ghostwriters that we use. So I, I tend to be the uh, captain of the ship. I'm not setting the sails anymore, but I, I started out that way. Yeah. Okay. So it's really it's interesting how um, you mentioned in ghostwriting, it's important to sound like the actual person who's supposed to be writing the book. Like their voice. You need to write in their voice. Yes. How how does how does that happen? Do you? have endless conversations with them where you kind of learn their rhythms and their, their diction and. Yeah, I'm a, I'm my, my degree is in radio, television and film, but my passion is psychology. And I, I listen real intently to the way a person speaks yeah. their eyes. You know, I do zoom calls like this with all my clients and my other journalist does the same thing. So we're, if they're not endless conversations, they're not random or they shouldn't be random. Occasionally yeah. they become random, yeah. but we generally set a couple of setup calls we go over their theme, what they want to get across, a little bit of their history, and what they what they really want to teach the world or what they want to give back. And once we find that out, we create an outline to follow or you know, a table of contents, really. And the table of contents is our, our shooting script. It's our interview process to go through each chapter and talk about their story, what it means to them, how it showed up in their life, how they, how they helped others. And uh, if they've got enough content there, great. If they don't, then we go outside their world into – the reader's world say, you know what? We don't need to do a chicken soups for the soul thing here, but you might get some other stories to back up this point. Let's go ahead and talk to some of your customers and we might expand the interviews beyond de- that author into their circle. Mm-hmm. But from all that information, we can definitely capture their style, which is it's not easy. Um, we don't you always normally hit it the first, first edit. And the funny thing is we don't speak the way we read. Right, and so yeah. these transcripts that we're looking at, sometimes it looks like just garbage. I'm like, where are, they, where are we going here? Mm-hmm. So it's really important for our ghostwriters to not just read the transcript, but listen and watch the interview as well. Mm. And I, so my, um, w- w- when I used to hear the term ghostwriter, I would just think of someone who, um, there were there was someone who needed to write a book. They couldn't, so they went to the ghostwriter and said, "Here, just write my book." And then that was it. Like the ghostwriter just did everything. But yeah. the but the author, the invisible author, yeah. I don't know how else to say it, but the person that is hiring the ghostwriter um, is is very active in the process because they have all the content like in their heads, yeah. right? Right. Okay. It's locked in their it's locked in their head in their journey. And here's the difference between a good ghostwriter. And an author who thinks they can write a book. And some people can't, but most people really can't. I'm sorry. But most people are like, I'm going to write my own book because I want to I be the writer. I want to hire someone else out. Okay, great. And I can read a book in the first chapter and tell you with 90% assurity which one was done, either a ghostwriter or you did it yourself. Because an author tends to write from their own perspective, which is fine. But I see gaps in the story or character development. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, man, I really would like to know what your wife is thinking just now when you made that decision. Mm, mm. And so an author might not want to reveal that, but a good journalist will ask all these spider questions to find out, well, where's this going here? And what were you thinking here? What time of the year was it? What, you know, what was going on in your life right then? A good journalist gets all the color yeah. and the context and environment for the scene and then decides whether or not with the editor and writer to, to put it in or not. So a well-crafted book is a story Stories right. sell. We communicate through story. And a well-positioned book is done with a team. You can't do it by yourself. Writing your book can work if you're, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, but I'm sure he's got help, you know? Right. Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that it, it takes a team because especially in the world of, of self-publishing, I think a lot of writers just want to do everything by themselves, right? Yeah, <laughs> Including the editing. <laughs> Um, and, and that's just not how it works. You really do need, you need, you know, beta readers, you need editors, you need all these people to, yeah. to help you craft the, the best piece of work. Yeah. And, and covers, I can't stand. I mean, yeah, people go to Fiverr and get a, a cover for five bucks. I'm like, well, that's what it's worth. That's worth five bucks. Mm. You know, we've got a, we got a full-time, full-time design team on staff 
that does unlimited revisions on covers. And our covers are beta tested with the audience before they're even published. So our covers go through at least a dozen or two dozen iterations. And we, even when those are done, we'll beta test it with a target audience. We do focus group research on the cover. Wow. Because if that doesn't resonate with the audience, they might not get inside to your, your book. And we judge a book by its cover. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking that. Like people yeah. always say you can't judge a book by its cover, but we do oh, that we all do. the time. We yeah. do it all the time, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. So then when you say that you help entrepreneurs – uh, build their influence with with best selling books. This is how it's done through ghostwriting. This is this is one of the triad of elements. Um, okay. A book is important because a book, as you can look on my bookshelf behind me here, those books are there. But every single social media post, P PR, video, online, even this podcast, is on and off in a moment. Mm -hmm. It comes in our brain and it goes out. Yeah. So while a book is is wonderful and a book will be around after we're gone a book by itself is not enough to be a person of influence mm -hmm. because not everybody reads right. <laughs> and not everybody finishes a book i read somewhere ebony that um 54 percent of books that are purchased are never even opened yeah <laughs> i can believe that you have can some believe. of those books yourself like i do i'm sure i've got a half a dozen i haven't opened up yeah. but i'm gonna get to them someday right. so it's important they have a good cover but it's important to have a multimedia experience as well so you're all my authors are encouraged to get on podcasts like yours or start their own uh do some live streams do some webinars uh do some live events go to a bookstore and do a book signing you know it sounds old school but there's a lot of things a person should do to build their brand and so our yeah our 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 influencer package the book is the fundamental piece of that but there's a whole lot of other components to help them out i mean that's so this is something that i know um a lot of writers really struggle with because we can be very introverted yeah uh and not just introverted just people that just don't i guess that is part of intro, being introvert but you don't like being around a whole lot of people or talking to a whole lot of people it's just draining physically draining i think that's what defines introverts right that's just yeah. draining to do all of that but when you want to um when you have something to share in the form of a book you do need to exert some influence over your audience or over people at least to attract an audience and so yeah you do have to do all this stuff like <laughs> <laughs> all this social stuff. How do you, you know, help guide writers through that? You, you do and don't. Um, I got this one book on my shelf. It's called A Thousand One Ways to Market Your Book, right? A Thousand and One. And I've never finished this book, right? Because there's a thousand and one ways. There's not just podcasts and video and uh, there's business cards. And there's so many things you can do to market your book. If you try to do more than a handful, you're going to get lost and you're going to dilute your own power. So if someone's not comfortable speaking, don't speak, you know, go ahead and focus on the written word and put it in multiple channels and be fine. Hmm. Now, getting away from social media is tough, but it's still doable. If you really don't want to be on, like, I don't really go on Facebook every day. I don't really care. My audience is on LinkedIn. So myself, my team goes there. So you don't have to be everywhere. You have to only be where your audience is. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, if I'm if I'm catering towards the uh, uh, you know 65 plus, I don't even need to be on social media, right? You know, I could just go in magazines. <laughs> I could just go in magazines and a bookstore. And I'm covered. Right. I get, if I get a deal with AARP, I'm set. <laughs> if I'm if I'm marketing towards uh, you know 25, 35 year olds, I better be on Instagram and TikTok, I guess. So yeah, yeah, I don't market there, so I'm not on TikTok. You know, right, 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 right. That's that's a really good point because I know you know every. We want to be everywhere because we think that's how you're going to attract the most people is that if you're everywhere. But that's, that's first of all, it's exhausting and that it's not very effective. You got to go to where your people are. It's a horrible waste of resources. I, I heard once that um, somebody asked, where's the best place to put a Burger King? And the answer was next to a McDonald's, right next door. Mm -hmm. Right, because you're already where people right. – People that want burgers are already at McDonald's. So why not? hungry. Yeah. Okay. Long, line is long there. I'm going over here. It's simple. Yeah. It's like it, it takes no effort to market if you're right in front of your audience. Yeah. So the ARP example is a great one. I'm working on a book, a health book right now for that crowd, and I haven't inked any deals there, mind you. But it's going to be a long term process. That's what my target is going to be. We need to get in like half a dozen magazines for the 50 to 60 or 70 year old crowd for this book for this product, and it's going to be a you know it's going to take some time, but 
I'm not going to bother with a whole lot of social media there. I mean, a little right. bit. Right. Yeah. That's actually, so like looking for um, publications like magazines yeah. um, where your audience lives, that's a good place to maybe even start just writing articles for them. Um, I worked with a, a consultant uh, last year to get my own articles published, right? So I, I got credentials with uh, Thrive Global and Entrepreneur.com, things like that, to build my authority in other areas. Mm -hmm. But it's not meant really to attract a whole lot of business. It's meant just to build my authority. And that's probably one of the key um, uh, misconceptions about PR. I've got press credentials with Associated Press, so I can publish in you know, a hundred different digital online news stations, you know, ABC, Reno and Fox Atlanta, things like that. Huh. And it looks really good for an author. Hey, I've been seen in these, these, uh, digital news stations. Right. But I tell my clients, you're not going to get any sales out of that. Mm. This is just a credibility piece. And I just makes me laugh when I see people say as seen on ABC. I'm like, really? What were you seeing? Okay. <laughs> were you on good morning America? Because one of my friends is a former producer there. And he would know if you're on or not. So ah. if, if you want to go that route, you can do it, but you better get the checkbook out because it's expensive to do that. We've, we've working on a client right now to, you know, Tom is my partner. He's former producer at Good Morning America and CNN and ABC News. So um, this guy's got the, a great story and we'll be targeting magazines as well as a couple of top tier, you know, TV outlets. But, you know. Right, right. So speaking of good story, Yes. And um, specifically in the realm of nonfiction, is that what you mostly deal with is nonfiction? Yeah, we've, we've um, uh, helped about 275 um, authors become number one bestsellers on Amazon. Two of those were fiction. <laughs> so it's mostly all, all nonfiction. Yeah. Right, right. So, so if I'm writing um, a, a, a book about um, some skill set that I have, I don't know, like I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm writing books about how to build businesses. Sure. How important is it for me to um, incorporate fiction elements, not not making up like my story necessarily, but I mean, just in the techniques that we use to write fiction, how important is it to use those in my nonfiction? Essential, imperative, must do it. Okay. I don't know if, you, if you're a Malcolm Gladwell fan, but I, I go through those books on audio and I cannot stop listening to them. The which ones? Uh, Malcolm Gladwell. Yes, he's one of my favorite. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. A lot of heady um, research and history, but you'll notice he, he drops breadcrumbs first. He doesn't tell yes. you everything. Wrong. He goes, well, what? I'm like, what? what's going to happen now? Right. And we do it like you watch the news. When we come back to the commercial, why pigs really can fly. There's always these open loops, Game of Thrones, right? News. Mm -hmm. Open loops are an essential element that, that taps into our, the psychology of our curiosity. We are curious beings. If we don't exploit our curiosity, you're going to bore your readers to death. Right, right. Don't write a, don't write a textbook. Mm. Write a story. Write a story that is engaging and doesn't give all the, you know, everything right away. You don't, you know, go to the uh, cafeteria and, and load up in the first thing. You want to look around and you want to, you know, take your time with it. And, you know, if you can get a sample, do a sample. But um, I don't even call those really fiction elements. I just call them storytelling elements mm -hmm. of um, breadcrumbs, open loops, cliffhangers. It's right. The same thing. And it's because I can imagine, do you ever um, run into writers who say, well, okay, I know business really well, or I know my skill set really well, but stories, like what story, how can I be a storyteller if I'm writing about business? Do you really need to look into your life and see where there's an interesting story that you can somehow incorporate into how you, you know, became an entrepreneur or right. whatever. You don't have to make it um, like 90% story, 10% teaching. You can balance it out any percentage you want. But if you don't put some element of story into your brand, into your message, I guarantee you, you will lose your audience. You will, you'll not be memorable. Mm. Think back on, um, the last good book you ever read. Mm -hmm. um, I guarantee you, you probably don't remember stats, but you remember the story around it. Right. Yeah. Because we are hardwired to communicate through stories. You know, stories predate language, for God's sakes. There's cave drawings of stories first before there was language. Right. It's in our DNA. So you better appeal to us, the, our, our desire to communicate through story or you're going to be flat. Your writing will just not be, won't resonate with the, with the person's passion, with their emotions. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. I can. There was this. Um, I mean, you see this in commercials all the time, right? There is this one, um, like a Bud Light. It was some beer brand. I think it was Bud Light commercial. Maybe. Uh, five years ago, I think it was one of those Super Super Bowl commercials, like, um, and it was this a story of a man with a he he was on a ranch and he had horses and then a puppy. The puppy got lost and somehow ended up like outside of the ranch, being uh, getting ready to be attacked by wolves. And all of a sudden, the, this man's horses come out, save right. the puppy, and right. then in the end, you see the the man with his puppy and the horse, and they're all. I'm like, what the heck? Does this have to do with beer? <laughs> but it's just, I just remember that. I remember the story. There you go. You yeah. made the point right there. You've made that point. I, I spent a lot of time in Thailand, and they have like two and three minute commercials. And they're as good as any Hollywood movie. I mean, they make minute me, commercials. Yeah. Wow. They make, they make me cry, Ebony. They're amazing stories. Amazing stories. And like, I don't know where it's going. I don't know who's sponsoring it to the very end. Oh, it's an insurance company. But the story <laughs> of the, the, uh, the guy who was a, a poor kid stealing food and uh, some guy gave, gave him food and the kid grew up, he became a doctor, became successful. And the end of the story is he's treating some guy in the hospital. And it's a guy that gave him the food. You know, it's, it's just like, oh, it's oh, just yeah. beautiful stuff. It's just, <laughs> I get goosebumps telling the story. As a matter of fact, if you want to look that one up and watch it, it's, mm, it's so worth it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Thai commercial, um, doctor, uh, stealing, steal, st kids stealing food, doctor. Just Google that in, in the videos. You'll, you'll, you'll dig it. Mm. So, it, so when, you're, when you're building your authority and, and you're building your influence, it's important to come across as an expert, but it's also important to come across as someone who's relatable. I get to reverse that. I think it's more important to be relatable first, expert second. Because hmm. term expert, think about that. Um, let's say you and I are both in the self-development industry. And we uh -huh. want to teach people how to be empowered or something like that. Well, there's Ebony and there's Doug and there's Tony Robbins. Um, who has more expert <laughs> status? Okay? Tony, yeah, of course. Right? So he's got more expert. Whether you like him or not, it doesn't matter. He has more expert status than you and I do. So... Being an expert, I'm not a big, I mean, I used to use that a lot in what I talk about, but the more I thought about it and go, you know what? I think I prefer to be effective first. So being relatable, so someone to actually have this conversation and then just do the darn work, be effective, help the per help your client with their goals and their dreams or aspirations. And that's your marketing. You don't need to be on ABC, CBS, and you don't even need the PR if you're effective with what you do. And you can, instead of talking about yourself, talk about what you've done for your clients. Mm. And then say, oh, well, he helped him out. Mm -hmm. I'm smart. Mm -hmm. that guy. He can help me out. So it's social proof is very powerful. And the third party social proof of being an Amazon bestseller, which we do, PR, which we do, but being effective as a vendor is the most important one of the three. In my mm, mm -hmm. And I know that you you are really big on perseverance. I think we mentioned this in the beginning. How has perseverance played? Speaking of stories, let's hear a little bit more about your story. How has perseverance played a huge role in your life? And then um, how can writers, how can we kind of um, embrace perseverance? Or great, I will I will I will answer that in a in a mixed up fashion for you. Yeah. Um, of all the things that people do um, in the world for work, I would say um, writing is in the top 10 most loneliest, most difficult professions mm. because you have no accountability. You're by yourself in front of your computer. There's no one chasing you, telling you you got a dead. Unless you're a, a journalist, you had no deadline. Oh, I'll do it later. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a coffee break, whatever. Right. So the, the perseverance angle of that <clears throat> is – is more important than anything else because there's no one hounding you. Mm -hmm. um, and the other dangerous thing with that is the self-doubt. Am I good enough? Is this, this is good enough? Who can I share it with? Mm -hmm. I remember the first time I, I published my very first book, you know, no, excuse me. When I wrote that first book, that was awful. I didn't even push publish it. It was so bad. I was, I'll oh, forget it. Mm -hmm. The second one I published and that's being reworked right now. Cause it's nine years old. I'm like, Oh, it's awful. So I'm re I'm redoing it. Yeah, but getting perseverance in your head and your heart, it's kind of simple. It's um, there's the pain of doing something and the pain of not doing something. 
Mm-hmm. And the pain of not doing something doesn't show up right away. It shows up later in life. So mm-hmm. as you get older and more experienced, you go, well, geez, you know, things start to show up like, well, I should have probably taken better care of my health or I probably should have written that book. I talked to a guy who was 72. I was speaking at a conference once, nonprofit owner, had like a 10, 20 million, smaller nonprofit, like a 10, 20 million dollar nonprofit. And we're talking. He said, yeah, I think about writing a book. I'm like, yeah, what's it about? He told me what it was. I forgot the details, but he was very passionate about this idea. Wow, that's a really cool idea. How long have you been, thinking about, long have you been working on it? I think I said, 30 years. Wow. Man, 72. And I said, well, that's great. Um, unsolicited advice. I wouldn't take another 30 years to finish it. <laughs> you might want to get going on that. Yeah. And the saddest thing, Ebony, is when I talk to people who've got brilliant stories and impactful ideas. Like as a woman who I talked to, oh gosh, over a year or two ago, who was a battered woman. Um, She got out of it. Somebody rescued her and she really wanted to give back and help out abused women in the country. I'm like, man, that's awesome. Let's do that. She told me her story, told me what she, what she did, how she got out of it. I said, we can, we can make this, we can make this important. We can make an impact. We can save lives with this book. Mm -hmm. Um, but we had a little problem of like, okay, how do we sell a book to people who are broke, right? To people who are already have their finances tarnished. And so we started gelling on the idea. I'm like, what if we marketed the book to uncles, brothers, fathers, sisters, mm. and mothers? Mm. And listen, the intervention thing is tough because, you know, a lot of women, women who are abused don't think they're being abused. It's a horrible right. cycle, right? So we need to find a way to, to market it, but also be respectful of, of the situation. So we mapped out this whole plan for it, the whole book and everything. She said, wow, that sounds great. Let's go. Okay, let's do it. Month goes by, crickets. Six months goes by, crickets. And I, you know, I, I don't chase people. Like, you got a good idea. I help you for a couple hours yeah. to help get this thing started. And you don't pick up the ball, do anything with it. I'm sorry, but there's no nice way to say this. She was given a gift. And maybe someone's going to die because she squandered it. I don't know. Mm. All I know is that if you got an idea and it can make a difference in the world, it's your duty to do it. Mm. Whether it's a book or not, I don't even care. But, you know, we are here for a reason. And it's not just to take up space and breathe oxygen. So do something with it. So that's my, um, that's on my stump about <laughs> making an impact. Do something right. important, you know? Right. I don't know so, where I was going. Back to perseverance. So her, right. her, she didn't have the perseverance. To, to do it. Maybe she was afraid, you know, get distracted. But her pain of not doing it wasn't strong enough. You know? mm-hmm. So those are the two pains. Pain of doing it. Oh, it's going to be a pain. It's going to cost me money. It's going to take time. Yeah, it will. Mm-hmm. But if you don't, what's what's the result? In her case, not, she, was re- she was rescued. She didn't have a, a passion to really pick up that torch and do something with it, which is fine. Maybe that wasn't her calling. Mm-hmm. But I, I work with people who do have that, who want to make a big impact and are dedicated to making it, making a difference. Mm. I love working with because they, they don't, they don't quit. They have yeah. Yeah. I like that. So, so it, it's more painful to not do something than to do you, something. You might have to put it in front of yourself, right? Like she didn't have anything in front of her to remind her that this was an important thing to do. Um, I have a new client, NFL player, who um, is a stay-at-home dad, and he loves it. He loves it. He grew up without a dad. He grew up in poverty and major abuse, a lot of, lot of crap in his life. And, um, you know, he had, you know, like one white friend help him out in his life, and he just reconnected with that guy just recently, and, uh, you know, tears were flowing on the, on the Zoom call. His purpose is to help men become gentlemen, right? It's to help these young boys be respectful. His wife runs the national domestic abuse hotline, mm. right? So I'm like, you guys are a power couple, right? They're yeah. biracial, both working on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the same topic from different angles. It's going to be a great book when we're done. We just, just got started actually when we're done with this call. Um, so his perseverance is without question. I make my clients commit to on their first call. I said, there's three ways you can fail as an author. First way is easy. It's to do some research. Make sure people want to read what you're talking about. The second way is to, um, you know, quit when you after you start, which I can't stand. Mm. The most popular way to fail is to not start. 
Mm. So the best way to succeed is to start, finish, do a little research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not rocket science. Yeah. And, and so, why do you think people start and then quit? Is it because they feel as though um, like what they're doing sucks? So why should I even move forward with this? Or is it just that wasn't even they're, they're not really committed in the first place? Yeah. Well, psychologically speaking, everything boils down to our limbic brain, our, our fight or flight response, our crocodile brain, whatever you want to call it. It's basically everything we do is based on fear and greed, everything. Mm -hmm. So you can call it reluctance. You can call it hesitation, lack of commitment. I'm going to use the word fear. Yeah. Fear of embarrassment, fear of not doing it right, fear of wasting time, wasting money. You know, mm -hmm. that's all, these are all valid reasons. Um, but, and if those reasons exceed the benefit, this is going to win. Mm -hmm. So all you got to do is make sure that your reason for doing it, like one of my clients is a veteran. And uh, his book is about his journey as a Coast Guard commander, you know, taking down drug lords. And, and he worked on the, um, the Deep Horizon uh, oil rig rescue. So his book is all about leadership principles from the front lines. But his mission, he told me in his very first call, my Doug, my mission is to end veteran homelessness. Hmm. Okay. Three words. He didn't say in, in, in Pennsylvania. Right. He didn't say in my lifetime. He said end veteran homelessness, period. And he's got a couple of stories how he, he started down that road. Mm -hmm. And I said, Craig, I'm with you. And I said, I don't know if we'll accomplish this in our lifetime, but I don't care. All I know is that that's the goal. We're going to get going on it. Because so he had big, a clear intention. Yeah. Big goals attract big money too, by the way. Mm. Small goals don't attract diddly squat. <laughs> so you might as well go big. Big goals attract. Say that again. Big goals attract big money. Mm. Um, do you know who Muhammad Yunus is? No. My hero. <laughs> back in the 90s, this guy, I wrote. I read an article about him in a, in a newspaper. I read newspapers back then. <laughs> yeah. I still read the newspaper. Oh, well, good for you, Evan. You're wrong. <laughs> he's, he's, I read this article that he was in Bangladesh, and some woman said, you know, can you give me a couple of dollars? And he said, you, you're weaving baskets here. Why don't you just sell my baskets? Oh, yeah, but I only make like, you know, five cents a basket. I need money for food and whatnot. He goes, why do you only make five cents a basket? Those things go for like, you know, $2 or something. Well, I got to pay a middleman and a middleman. He goes, well, how much does a middleman charge you for the basket material? Oh, like, you know, 20 bucks. And I wish she hadn't that at all. And uh, what if I loan you $20? Pay me back when you can. You do that? He said, sure. He pulls out a notepad, writes your name down. Gives her 20 bucks, so come back in six months and pay me back $20. Yeah. Muhammad Yunus started a thing in this world called micro lending. Hmm. And Raymond Bank does billions of dollars of loans now with the higher payback rate of any bank in the world. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize for this a few years ago. Wow. Muhammad's goal was to, three words, end global poverty. Huh. Wow. Tracks okay. big money because it was a big goal. It wasn't preventing people from starving in Bangladesh because nobody in America cares about that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. But when you say end global poverty and he's got an actual method and he took action to do it, he attracted big money. He attracted investors and stuff to help him with the bank. And you can look up Grayman Bank. I don't know how to spell G-R-A-A-M-E-N or something. Uh -huh. it's, um, look at you. Muhammad Yunus is on you know Wikipedia. You can see the guy. He's Right. Big goals, big money. Yeah. Yeah. So you have, so in, in writing your book, yes, it's important to have a clear intention and a big goal. And a, and a narrow, audience. Let's, and add a narrow that. audience. Let's add that for sure. Because as you know, um, a lot of the books are just the same out there. Yes. Perseverance, persistence, you can do it, blah, 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 blah. Um, there are so many self-development books out there. It's like I almost get bored reading them now because they all sound the same. Right. Yeah. And I go back to my friend, David Fry. David, back when I had his course, it's called the uh, Coaches and Consultants Boot Camp. It was on cassette tape. That's how old that one was. <laughs> but I know I he's on cassette tapes too. I, remember, I don't oh, still God. listen to Come them. I have any. You don't <laughs> cassette tapes. <laughs> and so D David, I'm like, David, and on his – Cassette tapes, what he did was, well, I'm a, I'm a marketing consultant. He's talking to his neighbor over the fence one day, 
and his neighbor owned a pool and spa <laughs> company, right? And David starts talking about marketing. Oh, that's a really good idea. You could help me. Oh, yeah, I'll help you out. Chat with him a little bit. He went back to his manual, took out the word business owner, and put in the word pool and spa manufacturer and gave it to the guy. And it's like, whoa, this is really cool. Within one year, David is the keynote speaker at the pool and spa national convention for marketing. Oh my gosh. He narrowed his niche down to one. Right. I mean, who would think about just writing a book for the pool and spa industry? Right. But if yeah. you did, you could make a million dollars. Wow. Dad, wow. most people write about marketing, self-development, empowerment, all these nice topics. But man, I can't encourage the listeners enough to just pick one narrow niche. I mean, you could pick left-handed 30-year-olds in Little Rock, Arkansas and make a living on it. Mm. You really could. Mm -hmm. That's a strange demographic, but you know what I'm saying. It's just yeah, yeah, yeah. pick a narrow niche and and own it. And then once you own that one, you can do another one. Mm -hmm. Stay mm -hmm. there. Yeah, that's that's I, I love that's a really great tip. I think a lot of people don't really think about their audience that much when and, that's kind of the key. <laughs> imagine looking imagine looking at a social media ad. You're on Facebook, you're scrolling through, and you see an ad that says, um, um, how to um, increase your sales as a consultant. You're like, okay, yeah, I'm a consultant. Now imagine if you saw a thing, increase your sales as a consultant in Pittsburgh or for um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, for the pool spa industry. Mm -hmm. That ad you'd click on because it resonates with you. Mm -hmm. Demographic or psychographic. Mm -hmm. But a general ad, a general thing about your book and idea, man, it's, um, and, and also, I mean, you could chicken soup it out. Start with one niche and then just do it again. Yeah. You pick your same book that you write about, say it's about self-development, and pick one niche. Say it's just for like just for 20-year-olds, right? And then just take the same book, change some words, make for 30-year-olds. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Chicken soup for the nurse soul, chicken soup for the bachelor soul, chicken soup right. for the they did the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And any author can do once they get one book, one narrow niche, just replicate it. Create a yeah. series. Much easier to do than to try to be Tony Robbins. Yeah. And I like, cause this kind of ties into what you mentioned earlier when you said, you mentioned that you were, um, you're redoing a book that you wrote yeah. some years ago. I think it's, that's important. That's an important point to make because, um, as, as writers, like what we write is not set in stone, especially if it's just up digitally, you can always go back and you can, uh, revamp. Yeah. Yeah. And we are so blessed and cursed with self-publishing, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's like, oh my gosh, anybody can publish. That's great. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, anyone can publish. That's awful because there's so yes. much garbage out there. Yeah. But it's it's the freedom and it makes for a flood of books. So our job is gotta be, I'm sorry, 51% marketing and positioning and 49% content. Because if you don't position yourself and market it properly, you could write, you know, war and peace and no one know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, how were you a, a big reader before you became a writer? No, no. I okay. love reading. Um, uh -huh. I didn't start reading until after college, actually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read my school books. I had to, but I didn't start reading fiction my, for fun until after college. And man, I love it. I mean, I, I studied TV and film. So I love movies. I love stories. I love reading them and watching them. Yeah. I'm always analyzing how they structure things. And um, man, I, I could have edited that movie so much better. You know, I watched one a couple nights ago. I forgot what it was because it wasn't that great, right? Yeah. But the one I saw last night, um, uh, Miss Sloan, brilliant storytelling it's on Netflix. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's the okay. What I I teach high school English, and there's um there's actually a unit on for there's a unit on short stories, huh? and so we read short stories and they write their own short stories, and then there's a unit on film and mm -hmm. the and film techniques and how. Uh, filmmakers use certain techniques to affect, right? Like use the lighting to to, to make yeah. it feel uh, dark, gloomy, scary. You use yeah. music. How do you think when you're writing, do you think in terms of film sometimes? I do. Um, I always, I mean, I, when I'm, sometimes, that's why I need a good editor because sometimes I'll go off for like three pages on somebody's room before I, before I you know, <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> no, I need I need a good editor because I'm I am visualizing. If you don't, if you can't write visually, mm -hmm. 
you gotta, it's gonna suck. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Think about writing the, you know, a sentence like, you know, George walked into the room versus, you know, the door creaked as the 30 year old uh, hinge waned against the, the, uh, the weathered wood yeah. and a breeze came in through the window. It was a crisp, cool fall day, about 50 degrees outside. You could smell the leaves as, as the door opened. I mean, you can go through a scene and you can smell it. You can see it. You can feel it. You can hear it. Yeah. It makes so much more of an impact than saying George walked into a room. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I loved, I, and I love teaching that that unit. The, yeah. the film that they uh, use is they actually. What is that director's name? He did Charlie and the Chol Chocolate Factory, not the one from the seventies, but the, the one new, from the like new, the new one. I don't know who. I just know Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they use a lot of Tim Burton films. They're really fun films to watch um, yeah, yeah. and analyze, but. Yeah. Right. That's okay. So now, Doug, we're kind of closing in on our time, but I, I kind of want to hear a little bit more about all this traveling that you did. <laughs> oh my! Well, <laughs> countries you know, and that's that's about to say, another time. I'll give you the short version. Is they? Uh, I was a um, I have a virtual business. I've got a, you know a full time team of seven people and a dozen freelancers, but I've had it way before the pandemic. I've been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. So because I've worked virtually on used to be Skype. Now at Zoom, mm -hmm. um, I was never um, required to be anywhere, so I chose to travel. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, forty-three countries now, all seven continents is by choice. I choose to go there, not as a tourist, but to go and travel and live and and work when I'm there. So sometimes I don't see a whole lot, you know. And I was spent six months in Brazil. I went to like you know three cities and you know went to the beach in a few evenings, but that's about it. Um, do you ever write about these places, Doug? Not really, no, no, okay. no. Is I give you a short a short story on one though. It's kind of fun, yeah. and we'll wrap it up if you like. But um, my son graduated college a few years ago, and three weeks before graduation, he's a dad. You know, I don't know what to do. I'm like, what? You're graduating in three weeks? Yeah. All my friends are interviewing and getting jobs, and I don't even know if I want to do anything in my major anymore. He was like, mm. just totally lost, right? That I said, oh my gosh, you're so lucky. Huh? Because you've been in school your whole life. You're going to work your whole life. This is the one time where you don't have to do anything. So I recommend doing nothing. <laughs> he said, go travel or something. Mm -hmm. I don't have any money to travel. I'm like, I'll hire you. You manage my LinkedIn account and let's go. Mm -hmm. We went around the world. We went to Thailand and saw the pyramids and went to um, saw the Taj Mahal in India, went to Greece and saw the Parthenon, went to Italy, saw the Colosseum, went to France, saw life. We went around the world for a year. Wow. And uh, we came back after a year. Wow, damn, that was awesome. What now? <laughs> I don't know. Get a job, man. I'm done with you. <laughs> 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 so the poor kid's in an office, you know, working on spreadsheets now after being around the world with his dad. Mm. So I totally ruined him. And uh, But now he knows the pain mm -hmm. of – Working in an office, which he's not wired for, versus the benefit of living a life of freedom where you can do what you want, wherever you want. Mm. So I planted that seed in him. Number one, it was it was fun for me. Number two, you know, one client contract paid for the whole thing, so it wasn't uh, expense. It was cheaper to to live abroad than to live in America. To travel wow. and Airbnbs and airfare with two people, I did the math on it. It was much cheaper to to travel than to than to live. Really. It's it was cheaper to travel abroad than to live in the United States. It was cheaper to travel around the world with my son for one year than to live in the U.S. I, I mean, we had we had an Airbnb in India with two master suites, two bed two bedrooms, two baths, master suites with a cook and a maid for like forty four bucks a night for both. What? Of them. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Now, it wasn't it wasn't super cheap in uh, in uh, France or Italy, but I had a I had a friend in France. I stayed at his his, uh, his villa, his compound for a week, and that was that was you know I met clients around the world, so I you know yeah. they were in town. Uh -huh. um, but everywhere else in the world is much cheaper than the U.S. except you know major cities and you know in Europe. But yeah, it was a great great time. And wow. it's, people all oh, people oh I wish I could do what you do, Doug. I'm like you can do it. I mean, it was pretty tough last year, but as things open up, you can go. You can go places. Mm -hmm. Just do it. You know, you got summers off, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm off now. Yeah. Okay. okay. 
So, so sometimes, Doug, it's just traveling is so exhausting for me. I just, I just really enjoy not having to do anything. <laughs> that's that's cool too. I understand that totally. I've been jet lagged plenty of my life, especially when I go uh, you know over to Asia from here. It's a twenty four hour flight. It's not not fun for those couple of days. Mm. But you know, you get an eight dollar massage in Thailand. It's it's pretty darn good. It turns out relaxes the. Uh, I yeah, I'm, I'm already starting to feel relaxed just hearing you mention and a massage in Thailand. <laughs> they invented that stuff. The Thai massage, they get the lactic acid out and the muscles relax. It's really amazing stuff. They've they know what they're doing there. Doug, uh, tell us where we can find you. You can find me online. Basically, I'm still, even though I'm not a big social media guy, I am online at uh, dougcrow.com. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody is interested in, in help getting help with crafting their book or publishing it or marketing it, I've got a, a complimentary assessment I do for them. That, that research thing I mentioned about actually making sure that your book idea and your cover and your theme is actually going to resonate with somebody. Mm. Our focus group program and the research we do, I do complimentary for anybody. It's uh, go dot real bestseller.com you can just sign up for that and you'll get me on the phone for a good 20 minutes we'll go through your idea and flush it out so mm. it's go dot real bestseller.com mm -hmm. and i'd like to give you this opportunity if you have any final words of wisdom or encouragement for people who feel like they want to give up on their writing project ah <laughs> uh, yes um who was it i think jack canfield told about it once where he said the best way to uh to write is just to write every day and not worry if it's one sentence or one page. Yeah. You get in the habit of it. It's like brushing teeth. You just can't go to bed without writing a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I do not have this habit because I'm I have hired people at this point in my life. But if you get frustrated, there's a thing called writer's block. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, we our minds are not linear, they're all over the place. And so he also said to make up like five or six separate folders. And write ideas, put them in those separate folders. Don't worry about gelling it all together. Just get it out of here, onto here, and you can organize it later. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the book Atomic Habits. Um, I just I read that book and like I it? love it. Yes. Yeah. Two minutes a day, right? Start with two minutes a day. The the idea of the habit itself, not what it what it means, was the biggest thing I got out of that book. I was yeah. like, oh, it's not it's not the habit. It's the idea of the habit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's I'm oh, so good. Malcolm yeah. Gladwell, Malcolm yeah. Habits. Um, yeah. What is the I, author's name? I always forget his name. Which one? What is the, the author's name of Atomic Habits? Oh, Clear. Yes, Clear. clear. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was, I, every time I have a guest on this show, not every time, but I'm exaggerating, but most uh, that book always comes up, and then I can never remember the author's name. Like, I can't yeah. think of his name, but that's a great book, yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, last name's Clear. I forget the first name. It's Thomas or it's Robert James or something. James or clear. something. Or John yeah, or something. Yeah. Simple. yeah, Clear. Atomic Habits, free promotion for you. Good luck to you, Mr. Clear. <laughs> biggest piece of insight that I drew from that conversation was when Doug said, big goals attract big money. I think that's so key. I think it's encouraging because I feel a lot of us are scared to have big goals, let alone share our big goals with other people because we feel we're going to look ridiculous and people are going to think we're just, we're being outlandish and that's preposterous. How in the world do you think you're going to end homelessness? Well, you're probably not in your lifetime. However, in setting the big goal, you are um, making big strides to achieve it. And in making those big strides, you're making big changes in your neighborhood, in your community, in your state, in whatever. So if you go too small, then you're really not going to make big effect. I think this is wonderful news. It just empowers people to go big, to dream big. So if you are interested in learning about learning more about Doug and his services and um, his story, then please visit his website. And in the meantime, visit Zazel.com, sign up for my newsletter, and you can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at Ebony Haywood, Instagram and, and Facebook at Motivation to Write. And thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you were inspired and, and encouraged by listening to Doug and his story. And I look forward to seeing you next week when I talk to another fabulous guest. Bye-bye.